Hey, Corey here. I got a great video for you today. This is going to be over the Yamaha Ultramatic primary and secondary sheave service. Now this is gonna be a one-stop shop type of video. We're gonna take you from beginning to end on both the primary and the secondary all packed into one. Now you might be asking, well, what's this video on? Is it on a Kodiak, a Grizzly, an R-Max, an X2, an X4, a Rhino, what, what? Yes, yes it is. Let me explain. So I've got this Kodiak 450. I've got an R-Max 1000, not in the picture. I have done sheave services on both of these and other Yamahas kind of in between that mix. So from one of the smaller ones to the largest. And what I can tell you is if you can do one, you can do all of them. Yes, there are nuanced differences. So some of the part numbers are gonna be different on different pieces that you may have to replace, um, kind of maintenance items in there. And some of the torque values are gonna be a little bit different from one machine to another. What you need to do is get a shop manual or look online for whichever particular Yamaha you have, get the exact part number and the torque specs. Everything else in this video is going to apply to you. There's going to be a little more information on uh, some uh, clutch tools that I have found that not only work on this, but all the way up to the R-Max in some ways, so they're very universal. Uh, I'll, I'll cover kind of where I got those and how those work in this video. So again, beginning to end, primary, secondary, you should get everything that you need here. I'm not going to get into, de into debates on... What's better, OEM or aftermarket? Should I go with grease or greaseless? I'm gonna show you what I do, and I might dabble into that a little bit as it comes up, but for the most part, this is more of a how-to, and if you wanna kinda of look into aftermarket parts and that sort of thing, you can still do that and use this video. Another question that we debate all the time is, how often should I do a sheave service on a Yamaha? There's a simple answer and a more a uh, complex answer. The simple answer is about every 1,500 miles. That's, if you don't really know what to do, start there. Now, my 1,500 miles probably look a lot different than yours and this person's and that person's. So that can, that's a kind of a give and take sort of thing. It's a moving target. But I will say that the smaller um, vehicles tend to wear items more slowly than the larger ones. If you don't really know when to change it, do it at 1500 miles and then look at your wear items in there, which we'll cover in this video. And then you can decide, do I need to do it more frequently? Is this about right? Can I kick it up to 1800 or even 2000 miles? And there's some, there's some ways that you can kind of help that longevity that I will touch upon too. I don't know which wear items I'm gonna need. Now I have checked stock at my favorite vendor and everything that I may need is in stock. So I feel very comfortable diving in, taking it apart, cleaning everything up, seeing what I need, ordering it, and then coming back and finishing that, that video with these uh, new parts. So I'm gonna, from this entry point on now, I'm gonna move as quickly as I can. All right, here we are down to where we can see everything. Yes. Some of these vehicles are much easier to get to this point than others. I've got a, this one's super easy, obviously, this uh, Kodiak. My R-Max 4 is on probably the other end of the spectrum. But I will just say that if you cannot get yourself to this point with whatever vehicle you have, I would probably recommend that you just not go any further. Um, I know that's not going to be many of you, but I'm just throwing it out there. Um, Hopefully you can get to this point. Now, this particular one's a little different than some of the others in that the bearing support cage, the bolts are the same ones that go through the cover around. And I know my R-Max is different than that. Doesn't matter, it's the same thing. Um, but my point is you need to pay attention to the bolt length. There are a couple bolts on this one. It is uh, one of the ones down here and one of the ones up there that are a little bit longer. So pay attention to that. As you pull this bearing support cage off, pay very close attention to these little dowels and where they're located. So one of mine came out, the other one stuck in. 
So I'm going to pull those out right now. This particular unit has two dowels, and I think that's pretty common with the Yamahas. I'm going to double check and make sure that there's no more dowels in there. You can see very clearly, if you're up close, where those dowels go. You really can't do it wrong. But uh, I always put those back in where they belong. And the next thing you're going to do is take one of the bolts from the cover or from the bearing support. I get one of the shorter ones. And you stick it in one of these holes right here. Either one is fine. And you're going to thread that baby down all the way. And then you're going to tighten it. And as you tighten it, it loosens that belt up. Now we don't need to go a long way here because that has already loosened it up as much as we're going to need. Now I do have some tools that I'm going to show you about later to help. Really, we just need to use these to help tighten these sheave bolts. Um, the side-by-sides and the bigger machines are a little bit different, but on this one, when we're taking these bolts off, I just do it the good old-fashioned style pop them right off with this bad boy right here. Now I always start with the primary, this side right here, and we'll just pop that thing right off. All right, there's that one. You will have a bolt and a washer. Don't lose that, don't mix anything up. Keep those to the side. So I always grab this like this. Do not cut yourself on this plate, it's very sharp. So as you're coming off, take a look at it. Same thing with the secondary. Take a look at your, the distance or the amount of teeth that are sticking out on that shaft and just make a mental note of that when you go back on. Now, we should be able to pop this belt off. Always pay attention to the way, to the, to the way, to the direction that it comes off. When this belt goes back on, we don't want to flip it we want to go the same direction, but make sure you remember the lettering on the belt and know are the letters facing to where I can read them or are they upside down. So I'm just going to make sure this goes back on the same way. I always kind of wipe, wipe this shaft off. At this point, I'll always take this back out and we're going to put that back where it belongs so we don't lose it. The primary, the fixed primary, or the part that does not move when we're driving just comes right off, just like that. The next part is to pop this secondary sheave off. And again, I have a holder, but why would we use a holder when we've got something like this to help us get it off? Now, these are, um, you know, this is where some of the nuanced differences can be. This front shaft, the primary shaft, had a washer. The secondary shaft on this particular one does not. Now your version might vary a little bit. So these are just things I'm pointing out to pay attention to. Nuts off, notice I put the primary and the washer back on. We'll pull the secondary off. And I'm going to put that one right back there as well so I don't lose it. Now, as you can see, this stuff comes off pretty easy, right? Um, now the fun really begins. We're going to start cleaning. We're going to start inspecting parts. Something else I wanted to back up and show you. So when I took this primary off, there is a collar inside. And mine came off with this, um, this outer portion of the of the primary and really what it'll do is it'll just come right out of there yours might be on the shaft right here or it might stick within here either way it doesn't matter as long as you know that it's there and it's accounted for on a side note as we're inspecting everything this four-wheeler has 1458 miles so the timing is about perfect i've never done a sheave service on this particular one i have on my last 450 um, but so the next thing you want to check this belt out you really want to look at the surfaces on the outside because that's where the contact is made that thrusts you forward and so this one looks really good it's very smooth no signs of any issues on either side but press it together just a little bit to expose if there's any cracks between here 
and these ridges, both on the inside and uh, inside and outside. So you're just gonna do that. This belt looks brand new, all right? Now, you do wanna measure to see the width of the widest portion of the belt to see if it's within its recommended life range. And that is uh, one of those nuanced specs that you will need to look on your particular Yamaha. But this one, this belt comes at 30.7 millimeters from here. So a micrometer, I mean, you could even use um, a little ruler if it has millimeters, honestly. Um, this particular belt is at 30.1, so it has barely lost anything. The limit is 27.6, so we are way above the limit. If you are close to the limit or you see any malfunctions of the belt, get a new one. But if you're like me, it looks great, it's well within spec, it's a Yamaha. That's the great thing about them. Keep it, use it. All right, so this is everything as, I, as it just came off. This is the uh, outer portion of the primary. Here's the inner. Here's this collar that I'm pulling back out. Set it to the side. We'll clean that up in a minute. I set this primary down. What you don't want to do is strip any of these screws in this grease plate. So I usually use one of these. And I got all those broken between shots, pulling this last one out. All right, now I've got all of these. These do have little, what appear to me to be copper washers that we don't want to lose track of. So all those four come out of there. And now this grease plate's ready to come out. I have to apologize, the video's probably gonna shake a little here so what i kind of do with this there's a variety of different ways you find a piece of wood pry this apart pry this cover off here this grease cover um, screwdrivers tend to ding it up a little bit one thing i found is if you get something that will fit into the hole there and rest that on and then you tend to be able to finish it off pretty easily like that and that that pop just got it. Now I had it already started as I went around with that screwdriver. There's a variety of different ways. Um, just be careful not to cut yourself and be careful not to, I mean, you know, tear anything up too much. Once that's ready to come off, this just comes right off. Now there's a seal, a rubber O-ring that goes right around there. And this one came off came out as I was knocking this um, cover off. So now I went ahead and kind of wiped this O-ring down and uh, you want to inspect it. Make sure it's in good shape. Make sure it's not damaged in any way. As cheap as these are, mine is a little oblong or lopsided from being compressed so long. It's not perfectly round anymore. I'm going to order a new one of these. They're so cheap. And so from, net, from, here, from here, before we get into this part, I'm gonna clean up this cover. All right, this plate is good and clean. All right, and this is really, this is the biggest advantage to going greaseless is the service part. This is, it's just, it's a mess, All right? The next thing we're gonna do is bring out this sliding plate that holds the weights in and this sits in there. So right now you just pull this out. This needs to be thoroughly cleaned. I like to use a little brake cleaner. And then you will see in here eight weights. And these all just, they just come out. All right, so you'll take each individual one out and I've got to clean all of this up. I'm gonna do it off camera and then we'll come back and talk about measuring these weights and inspecting them. Something I wanna bring your attention to as I'm cleaning here, there are parts where this grease, yes, it's changed colors a little bit, but the consistency is very good. It looks consistency-wise like it's brand new. But then there are other parts where the consistency, I don't know if you can see it's more like a, a paste that's starting to dry. 
Um, I just, I don't know if you can see that. But the consistency is much tackier. It's dry. It's starting to dry. And that is something that you can address with a different type of grease that we'll talk about uh, towards when we start greasing these things up. For this particular vehicle, I am going back with the stock Yamaha Ultramatic grease because it's so cheap and because this is a Kodiak 450. In my R-Max, I went back with Tink Seal. It is better than this, but it is a lot more expensive than this. This I, I can't even remember what I paid for this. I've had it a little while, maybe 10 bucks. I mean, it's, it's cheap. And it does do the job decently well, but I don't think you're gonna see that drying from the from the tink seal. Just something to note, um, we'll talk a little bit more about grease and tink seal and ultramatic grease and all that once we actually get to the point. I'm gonna finish cleaning this up. The next thing we're gonna do, so I've got these parts mostly cleaned up, but the next thing we really wanna do is get this, there's a grease seal on both the inside and outside of this outer primary. And so I've got this seal puller. I don't know if this one's gonna do the trick. Oh yeah, easy. Pops it right out. This is actually a trailer bear, wheel bearing puller. Pulls them right out of there, no problem. All right, that's going to allow us to clean the inside where the shaft goes through. It is really nasty and crusty in there. So we need to clean that out so we can inspect it. All right, so I kind of, I'm gonna reverse engineer everything here. I got the primary all cleaned up. This is the grease plate or grease cover and the O-ring. This O-ring keeps the grease in and not coming out into your belt area. That's all cleaned up. Got the cam plate and the pucks. These pucks are a different style than the R-Max, but they, like if you can do these, you can do those. And if you can do those, you can do these. It's, it's the same thing. You wanna ensure that you really inspect these pucks as well. These are very important items because they are constantly being used as this primary is shifting up and down. And the place that you really want to inspect is where it rides against that column on the inside there. All right, so just give those a good, pull them off, give them a good visual after you've cleaned them up and replace as needed. These look brand new, okay? We want to inspect the back side of this to make sure that there's no imperfections where those roller weights ride. Now we get down into here, we get into the weights. There are a few that have some little flat spots, but it's nothing that you can even see hardly from the side profile. You can really see it more straight on. Um, these start off new at 30 millimeters. Again, that would be different from the R-Max, obviously. But that's where the, you know, we talked about the specifications and some of the numbers are different, but it's the same job. Okay, so 30 millimeters, 29 and a half means these need to be replaced or if you just see some major damage. These are really close to 30. They're good for another run. So even with this, these little flat spots, I've inspected all these and they're good. You want to inspect these channels to make sure just like the back side of this cam plate that there's nothing that these weights are riding on that's going to damage or hurt them. Okay. On this back side, you inspect these sheave surfaces on both sides by running your fingernail, getting a flat piece of metal and following it around just to see if there's any issues. Mine does have a few little specks here and there I don't I don't know if you can see any of that um, maybe three or four but they are so minor they're not gonna hurt anything it's something though this is why you service it something I'm gonna make a note of keep an eye on next time I service this thing what I'm going to need to replace and my whole primary is only this o-ring for the grease plate or the grease cover and some new Ultramatic or Grizzly Grease, and the inner and outer, inner and outer seals, okay? All cheap, all easy. But you can see, right, like this is this is out of the R-Max, this one, obviously, this one's out of the Kodiak. It's the same thing, but I hope you can see why 
You know, if you're a little nervous that I'm doing a lot of this on a Kodiak and you're going to do an R-Max, don't be. I just did my R-Max uh, earlier this year. It is the same job. As you're cleaning up parts, do not forget to, to clean up this collar, particularly on the inside. Now, I'll use a screwdriver and uh, some kind of cloth, but be sure that you're not scarring up the inside of that. And I also make sure that these holes get cleaned out or blown out so that they're because usually the grease that gets in there solidifies or turns hard and so always clean that out as well make sure you also clean up this primary support cage and there is a bearing out here in this outside i just had this off a second ago but i'll show you i already loosened that up um, this does tend to get some stuff even behind here. I wipe this all up, wipe the surface of this bearing up, and then I'll put this back together and I'll put a little, just a tiny bit of a Loctite on there, but clean that up as best as you can. So we are good to go with this primary. It is ready to go. We're gonna need to grease it and everything like that, but we're gonna order those few parts. The next thing we wanna do is remove this secondary spring retaining nut, and we need to do this by hand, not with any power tools. I just clamp it down just like this, and then I've got a 45 socket. The R-Max and some of the bigger ones are a 55. Sometimes this really takes finding the right angle, using your hand to hold it down or get somebody else out here to help you. Don't judge me for my breaker bar. All right, that's all it takes. Now, that we don't go any further than that. So I barely turned it. That's back to tight. That's back to loose. And you never go up above this just for your own safety. These three blue parts came as a package from Grizzly Clutch Tools. It's on Facebook. It's a guy out of Canada. Really makes a great product. You slip this thing into a vise. And it did also work for the Armax. These two I'll talk more about once we're going back on here in a little while. This was my old homemade spring compressor. Not anything nearly as good as this one. Now we're going to get this secondary. Slide it down onto here. And then the parts that came with this include this cover. That goes around that nut there. You just got to kind of line things up washer nut now that we've kind of tightened this down by hand and tried to center everything and remember that nuts just barely cracked off barely any at all and then once we get that there we start to tighten this cut down don't go crazy and then just put your finger in there and then you'll see that that nut comes right off so the nut is off and all the spring tension now is in this tool. And then we'll start to back her down nice and easy. All right, we're coming off the top here. We're gonna take this holder off with the washer, set it aside. Here is your spring nut and your little cover there, a spring retainer. And now that spring comes off. Now, yet again, <clears throat> just like on the primary, we need to disassemble and clean everything up. The spring cut can be a little snug, but if you get under there, there it's coming loose. It's had a lot of tension on it for a long time. So this comes off, <clears throat> set that to the side. So as you go around, there are some pins that are in here and we're just gonna grab them and pull them out and set them to the side. Once you get these pins out, there may be more pins on, on some of the other ones. I honestly can't remember how many are in the R-Max, but it works exactly the same. Once those pins are out, you can now separate the secondary by pulling this uh, inner, it's really the inner piece off. And now what we need to do is check the surfaces again on both sides where the belt rides. We need to clean both areas inside and outside pretty much clean everything up you want to come back to this portion of the secondary and you will see that there is an o-ring here and here and so just use a little tiny screwdriver all 
All right, there's those two O-rings from there and there. The next thing we wanna do, just like our, with our primary, there are grease seals. There's one here on this side. See if I can get this tool to work again. Yep, no problem. There's one. There, it flew up and stuck on the wall. All right, now we're gonna clean this bad boy up because I got, I got a little bit of a mess to work with here. So I've got everything cleaned up here. So just to recap, you had the nut, the spring retaining retainer, the spring. Then we had this um, cover here that goes over the pins. We really want to inspect this, especially in here, to make sure everything's feeling nice and smooth. You'll see where it's worked in and polished, but that's all right. Inspect here as well. Everything looks great there. Then we want to see how everything just kind of feels now that it's nice and clean. Now it's going to be a little clunky because there's no grease, but it should be a smooth operation there. The only thing I did not reinstall here is I'm taking this back apart where the, the two O-rings and then the two seals here and on the other side of. So I got all these pins pulled out except this one. We're going to pull that out now. We're going to inspect each and every one of these pins to make sure they, that they still look good. And as we pull this back off here, obviously we're gonna inspect everything, make sure all the surfaces, like where the spring rides is looking good. You will see some, what look like cracks, that's just imperfections in the casting. So those are not actually really cracks. We will again inspect these surfaces. These look really good. Next thing you'll want to do is kind of get these pins and just set them in here and make sure that they're still a decent, decently smooth and precise clearances. You'll also want to put them back in here and make sure that they're not wobbling and they're not. Okay, so everything looks good here. Again, inspect everything. Just take, just do a once over and make sure there's no parts that are wearing out. Another thing that you can check is the length of your spring. Check a service manual or a forum or a Facebook page to find your precise measurements. But this one is at about 117 millimeters. And the range is 115 to 121, and that's freestanding with no pressure. So the spring's getting closer to its, um, to its life range, but it's still in there. So I'm going to go with it and check it again next time. Make sure that you clean the inside of this out again and these little holes for the pins. Do the best you can. So everything looks good here. I am going to order... Two new seals, grease seals, that I popped off here for this secondary. And I'm going to go ahead and get two new O-rings as well. These things, like I said, their muscle memory isn't perfect. So you saw before, I already have some of this um, Ultramatic grease. And this is for the primary. What I forgot to tell you was, technically, the secondary calls for a different Yamalu product. Now, I already had that, so it didn't cost me anything. This is 4.5 ounces. It cost $10. Uh, and this is what we use on the secondary. It's a polyurea grease from Yamalube. I do believe that Tink Seal is a superior product, and the advantage is you can use Tink Seal in both the secondary and the primary. But like I said, the disadvantage is that, so both of these together, nine ounces cost about 20 bucks, and the Tink Seal for four ounces cost about 25 bucks. So, you know, factor that in. Had I not had either of these, I would have just ordered some Tink Seal, but because I already had that, I'm gonna use this stuff up. This is a great time to clean up some of these sheave surfaces. Now, some people will cover the sheave surfaces up, and I there is nothing wrong with doing that. That would help keep this surface cleaner, no doubt about it. I've found it takes about as much time to do that as it does to just try to keep these clean and then give them a final cleaning before assembly. So we received our parts and the first thing we wanna do, we're gonna begin with the secondary going back together, is get the grease seal 
and you will go with the grooved side down or the flat face side up. And I will just set it on there like this and very carefully, I'll kind of put one end a little bit further down than the others and then very carefully start going with the other end and then make my way around where it's the highest sticking out until it's most of the way in. Flat all the way around. And these do go in dry. Again, groove side down, flat up, same way as last time. I'll put one edge down a little bit further and then go to the other. This one's a little harder to get the board on because of these rivets that are sticking up. So I just bit more carefully go around. Now I've got the seal flush with the face of the sheave, both on the inside and outside. The next thing we're gonna do is get these O-rings and put them back onto the secondary. And you're gonna to wanna to just get a little bit of grease and grease those bad boys up. The outer one first. All right, after that first one, we're gonna go on with the second one. Slide it over. That first one down into the first slot. I don't know how well you can see this, but there is a recessed portion inside of this part of the secondary. And we just wanna fill that recessed portion with a little bit of grease. Um, you don't wanna overdo it, but you do wanna make sure that there is some grease filling that void. We are also going to, and they kind of fill themselves as you're doing the inside, but we're gonna fill these little holes. Again, keeping caution to keep grease off this face, but we will do a final cleanup. So I've got that inside cavity filled where it's recessed. Now I will very, very, very lightly, and when I say lightly, I mean just about the least amount you can put on from about the holes here up. The reason is because the grease seal is going to go over that and it's going to drag a lot of what you put on here out into here, which technically you don't want it there, but you do want this portion to have a little bit of grease. Now you can do a little cleanup just right up here on these threads and at the top. And then we're going to set the secondary, the inner portion on and gently, that wasn't gently, but it's now on there. Now what we're gonna do is take some of this polyurea grease and fill these grooves up. I went ahead and lined up the hole in there so I can get these pins in, because I'm not gonna be able to see in there very well, obviously, once I get these slots or grooves filled up. And then I'll take the pin and it kind of lubes itself here. And push it on in all the way. And then I'll go back over and I want to I just want to make sure that I'm getting enough grease inside of there repeat on either your other three or five pinholes, depending on your vehicle. I now have all the pins in, and I'm just gonna go around, make sure those O-rings that I put on are covered in grease. Make sure there's no super high bulges of grease as we get ready to go back on with the cup. So it's just kind of a round, slick surface. And then clean up any other areas outside of that <clears throat> we're going to get the cup we're also going to lubricate the inside not a lot just a nice smooth layer as well as this lip around the end and then we're going to slide this on just like this all right so we got that down sometimes I will pop this cup back up just a touch to get any grease under here and then we'll go back down all the way this is a good time with nice clean gloves or hands to pop this thing out 
and start to test its range of motion. Make sure everything is feeling nice and good. It's going to be a little stiff at first because it's got so much grease in there. Just make sure that that motion is feeling good. And it is. Now, while it's open, get you another rag. Get you a little bit of brake cleaner. Get it on there. And then we're going to do another clean out of the sheaves um, faces first. And I'm really going to do a good job here. You do not want grease where your belt is trying to gain traction. And then there may be a little bit of grease down on this center piece. Of, I don't know, you call it the spindle or what you want to call it. I used maybe half of this polyurea grease on the secondary. Just so you know, this uh, four and a half ounces should get you at least two changes. So here we're outside of the grease seal. So we really don't want any grease out here. So now is the best time to do just a final spot check. I will get a tiny, tiny, tiny dabble of grease to put on the bottom of this spring, and then I'll just set it down just like that. I will also put a little bit of grease in this uh, spring retaining clip or washer. Now we're back on with the spring, with the retainer, and with the nut. And then we go back on with our tool in reverse. As you begin to tighten this down, make sure things are staying centered and that you don't all of a sudden catch a tight spot and try to push through it. As the threads begin to appear, it does not take long before it starts to snug up. And you'll just go, you know, it'll get tight and you just go a touch into that. And then you'll get onto this nut and you'll start to thread the nut. And you'll thread it all the way down far as it'll go and then we're going to back this tool off again now it'll take the tension off the tool put it back onto that nut I've got it locked back down here and the torque spec for this is set 65 foot pounds on the Kodiak check your vehicle for what yours might be that's 65 Same thing on this outer portion of the primary. We need to put our grease seals in. Same way, the side with the groove, and you might see a little spring in there that goes in. You want mostly, it's mostly a flat face to be facing out towards you, and I'll drive those in the same way I did on the secondary. It's right smooth up to the outside edge. Now the manual is very clear that it wants 90 grams of grizzly grease inside this portion of the primary for the weights. So I got about 90 grams, it's about 3.1 ounces. So I'm just estimating pretty close since this is four and a half. Now why they call for a different grease inside the primary as to inside the secondary, I have no idea. The secondary again was that polyurea grease the inside of the primary here is similar in that it has just a real small cavity in there that you want to put a little bit of grease in. Not a lot. This is very little. And we're going to put it in there. Now that I have lightly coated and kind of filled that void inside of there, I'm going to start taking this about 90 grams. And again, check your shop manual to see what yours calls for. And I'm going to coat these ramps all the way around where the weights ride. Now, there's some void spaces in here, too. You don't need to grease those. You just need to grease the ramps where the weights ride. I now have these ramps all coated all the way up the side and up kind of partially on the inside there, anywhere those weights can ride. Now we're gonna grab these weights one at a time and look at about how much grease there. Now I've got eight weights, so I'm gonna take, oh, I wanna to try to leave enough to where I'm equally distributing the grease. And you wanna have a little left over at the end. So just kinda of coat those up, drop them straight down in there. 
Now, I've got that done. Now, as soon as you have this installed and you begin to ride, all this grease due to the uh, G or G forces or inertia of the primary will fling out to the edges. And so that's where you want to put the bulk of the remainder of the grease. So we're going to get a little more grease here and we're going to kind of fill in that part right there. And then we're just going to go around and do that on each one of these ramps. All right, looks a lot like that. And then we need to go around and grease these columns where the pucks slide on. And then just any extra grease that you have, you can kind of fill in these other voids around where those pucks go as well. I now have that inner surface all coated up. So the columns, the backs here where the rollers go, and then a little bit on the rollers. You can kind of see my consistency. The next thing we'll do is put this O-ring on. And this goes around the outside here. There is a groove for it and we're going to go around and just pop it in just like that and then you want to go around and visually inspect that you got that in right the next thing i've done is put a little grease where the weights are going to ride against this cam plate now if you have an r-max or uh, a vehicle where these need to be more pressed in instead of just falling in you would probably put those pucks on before you did this. And now I'm going to put my pucks in. On this vehicle, these pucks go in with the thick side to the back. Some of the other ones will have a mark that faces back. My best advice I can give you is um, look at how it comes off, right? You don't really need to do a whole lot of greasing of these pucks because we already did these columns that ride up and down. And so that will, in essence, lubricate them for you. You will notice that these weights are all positioned in the um, inside of this sheave, and that's where you want them to be. Then we'll get this plate, we'll slide it on there, and this should be a nice, easy, free operation here, okay? Particularly uh, on the R-Max where, and some of the other ones where these pucks, if you don't have them seated all the way, this will not move freely. Now the grease slows it a little bit, Okay, but this one's on there, it's looking great. So from this point on, you do not, you can move this thing all around, but do not let this plate come off those weights. We're gonna keep pressure on that plate all the time. If you let this slide back off, you could lose some of your weights from the channels in here. And if you get it all put back together, you're gonna have, you're gonna know real quick you've got a problem. So keep pressure on this anytime you move this primary. Now, let's put this cover back on. As long as you've got just a touch of grease out here around this O-ring, you should be in great shape to get your plate. Get this cover and line up the screw holes and then just nice and gently try to go right over the top of that O-ring and it went right on. Now I'm gonna give it a good little push to make sure it's seated, and then I'm gonna spin this all around, and make sure that that plate is on there all the way. Now we're gonna put the screws back in. I said earlier I was gonna put some Loctite in on these. There is no need to do that. It's just nice and snug is all those need to be. All right, and again, hold that plate down anytime you're moving it around. Now I'm gonna go clean these sheave faces. I have lightly lubricated the primary shaft with some of this Grizzly Ultramatic grease, and then I used some polyurea grease lightly on the shaft for the secondary, keeping consistent with what Yamaha wants you to do. Next, we're just gonna go right back on with this secondary. Sometimes this takes a little bit to get it to go. And there, there it just went. Now we got a little bit of grease here on these threads. And remember here on the secondary, it was just one nut and we're gonna tighten that in all the way. You do wanna make sure that that secondary is seated all the way. The next thing we wanna do is make sure that our secondary gets tightened properly. This is one of those tools from Grizzly Tools that I was telling you about earlier. Comes with the screws that you need, thread it in and you will then use the screws that came with it to screw into these two parts right here. For the side-by-sides, unless you have 
Dwayne Johnson and Vin Diesel uh, to hold on to different things for you, uh, you need to use an impact. And so look at your torque values. There's a big range in impacts. You need to know what yours drives and get a real good estimate as to how long that you need to kind of crank down on there. It is 75 foot pounds. Yes, I have an old school torque wrench. Don't bust me up too much for that. And that's 75 foot pounds. And then it just comes off the same way. And then you can store the, these bolts right back into the tool. On my R-Max, I use this, and I know what this thing's capable of. I know uh, how long to use it to get the torque that I need. The next thing we're gonna do is go in with the inner or fixed portion of the primary, get it onto the splines all the way. Now that we've got this reinserted and have this uh, secondary as far apart as it'll go, we're gonna put the belt back on and we want to make sure it goes the same way. And I'm looking at my arrows there. And then right into the secondary, we want to make sure that the interior to this is repacked with Ultramatic or Grizzly Grease, mostly in that recessed area. And we're just going to push it right into there as far as it'll go. Holding this plate still, we're going to go back on to the primary shaft we don't want to pinch down on the belt itself and that's what can happen really easily if people will tighten this up and they're not all the way tight on the collar all the way through or pinching the belt and then they're going to have a problem later i asked at the beginning for you to get a little visual representation of the gears or the teeth that are sticking out mine is where it needs to be so then we'll go back on with the washer, back on with the nut, and you want to make sure that you're getting that nut all the way tight. And then once you have it finger tight, that's when you can kind of start moving things around and making sure that belt is not pinched in there and ours is not. It's 74 foot-pounds of torque. Right there. So now we will pop this tool back off. You can restore the bolts right back in there. We need the belt to engage both the primary and secondary. And to do that, you just start to turn it. Now that belt's nice and tight. Again, one of the beauties of the Yamaha Ultramatic. My dowels are already in place. My two dowels that we've talked about in the beginning already in place. Line up the center shaft coming out here. There it is. Now, for the sake of if, if your primary support cage is separate from the cover, you can go ahead and tighten that up right now. Tighten this whole cover up. If you are like me and it's part of the outer cover, I'm still going to put these two main bolts in because we're going to start and verify that these clutches are operating properly before we put everything back together. And same for this primary. With the side-by-sides, you may have to use your impact. Know your impact, know your torque specs, and put it on there and get it on there as close to the specs as you can. Also, I forgot that I need to put these back in. I had them in, but I need to put them back in after using the Older. Now we have started it up and we're going to make sure that everything's operating normally before we put the cover and everything back on. So other than that um, primary cage rattling just a touch because I don't have all four bolts in, Everything is moving and shifting and operating exactly as it should. So now we can go back on with the cover and everything else. So hopefully yours started up and everything shifted in there properly, just like mine. If you followed all the steps to the T, you should have no issues there. I hope this is a resource that people can utilize in the future as they do these Ultramatic um, services. Thanks for watching. Happy trails.